All right, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I, I milled around and asked a few of you why you're here. And it sounds like you're in the right place, which is good. It's exciting to be in the right place, get the information you're actually looking for. Uh, and so I hope I can deliver on that promise today. Uh, my name is Jeff Blankenberg. I'm here to talk to you about 10 things every voice application should do. I like to think of these best practices as pretty universal. It doesn't matter what you're building, whether it's a, a game, or if it's a shopping experience, or a healthcare experience, uh, or whatever it is. I think you'll find a lot of things um, that you should be thinking about as you go into your skill building journey um, that you'll find in this presentation. So this is a, there are 10 points. If you think about the fact that I have 60 minutes to give this presentation, I can't spend more than six minutes on any one of the points. Um, and in fact, there might even be some bonus content here at the end. So we'll see how far we can get through all of this. Uh, but let's get started. Let's talk about number one. So uh, these are not in ranked order, although I would consider this one to be one of the top things that you, can sh you should consider. And that is to do one thing really well. There are a lot of times as we think about building applications, whether that's mobile or web, uh, or certainly for voice, where we have these big picture ideas about what we want that application to do. And it's got so much scope, right? All the golden plating in the world. And ultimately, we have to scale it down to do something first, that minimum viable product. So as we think about doing the big stuff, we have to think about how we do one thing really well for our customers first. I have an example of a skill that I've built. It's called Games Back. Now, we are outside of the baseball season right now, but when it's in the baseball season, I, every morning, used to get up and look at a chart that looks like this. Tons and tons of data, lots of information here, but at the end of the day, there's only one thing that I really care about, and that's this column. Um, well, I care about my team, Cleveland, but then I care about this column, uh, games back. For any of you that are baseball fans, you know this is the statistic that tells you the most information about where your team is in the standings. Because it's not just about wins and losses, it's about your relative position compared to the other teams in your division. And so what I wanted to do instead was to build a skill that could just give me this information. Now as we think about all the things I could have done, right, I could tell you everything about your team and all the information that goes into that, but at the end of the day, all I care about is games back. So let me give you a quick illustration of what this skill sounds like. Alexa. Open games back. Welcome to games back. Which team can I help you with? Cleveland Guardians. The Cleveland Guardians are currently in first place in the American League Central. The Chicago White Sox are 11 games back. What team do you want to know about next? Washington Nationals. Washington Nationals. The Washington Nationals are currently in fifth place in the National League East, 46 games back of the Atlanta Braves. What team do you want to know about next? Stop. Alexa, stop. Going to fight me here. The, the problem I have right now is that there's a echoing microphone in addition to my voice, which can be a little confusing, but I think we're good. We'll see if it talks again. Anyway, the only thing that skill provides me is that games back statistic. Now, I could eventually add more features that tell me how many wins or losses or anything else that fits into my team's statistics, but at the end of the day, I need to do that thing really well, or it doesn't really matter what the rest of the information I provide is. And as we think about all the skills that we could build, there's a lot of data, a lot of information that our customers may want, but we should spend the time and identify what are the things that they most need from us. And we'll talk more about this later, but it's really important to think about what is the data that a user can get the easiest, right? We have websites and mobile apps. If someone can pull their mobile app out of their phone and they get the, in, in, the information instantly, like the bank balance in a banking app, that's probably not the stuff we need to focus on the most for a voice experience. We want to make sure that we give them the information that's a little more buried but is the most important to them. OK, that was number one. Let's talk about number two. Our second big tip is to make your name memorable. And I've had lots of ideas about skills that I wanted to build, and we'll, I'll tell a story here in a second. But it's important to make sure that your users can remember the name of your skill. And this sounds obvious, right? Of course, we, of course they're going to remember the name. But as we start to build things, and we, especially if we're building a brand new thing from scratch, 
many times we come up with really clever names. And so one of the examples of a name that I really like is a skill called the magic door. This is a great name for a number of reasons, but to open it, you say, Alexa, open the magic door. Welcome back to the winter adventure. As we follow the trail, we walk through the trees, and a crow calls out. Hmm, I wonder if he's hoping for a snack. We keep going. Alexa, is it? Stop. Okay, goodbye. For tips and tricks, visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Alexa magic door. Okay, so in that example, you can see that it's, a, it's an adventure game, right? We're going out and we're exploring a world, we're walking through the snow, crows are cawing. But at the end of the day, it's very easy for me to remember how to use their skill. First, it's called the magic door. When the skill starts, I say open the magic door, a very memorable phrase. And when the skill actually starts playing audio, what's the first thing we heard? An old creaky door open, right? These are all reinforcement moments that remind me what the name of that thing is. There are a bunch of ways that you can do this. You can see that we have a, I have a whole bunch of examples here. But they all start with a phrase like these. Ask, begin, launch, load, open. All of these words, as far as these devices are concerned, are the same. They don't have any real meaning. But what they allow you to do is phrase your marketing, all of the things that you're going to tell people about how to use your skill. It allows you to specify it in a way that's very memorable. Ask the experts is a great example. Your skill is called experts or the experts. Um, we have another one called the race trainer, right? Let's use the word run. Run the race trainer. Uh, or start your engine. Your engine might just be a, a car diagnostic skill, right, that tells you about what's going on with your car. But by doing these kinds of things and using those kinds of phrases, you can make it very easy for people to remember your skill. But beyond that, we as technologists, as developers, we like to be unique and creative. And we like to come up with interesting games, interesting names for our skills that are a little beyond unique, a little beyond memorable sometimes. I have a skill, uh, and I'll, I'll, we'll play it here in a second. The whole point of the game is that I give you three clues. Uh, I'll give you an example off the top of my head, and then we'll, we'll play the game in a second. Um, I'm going to give you three clues. You guys have to figure out what these three things have in common. The first one, fruit. The second one, ears. The third one is socks. Those three things have something in common. You can stew on that for a little bit while I tell you the rest of this story. So as I'm building this game, I have to present the user with these three clues, and they have to figure out what the scenario is. And so I was really trying to come up with some kind of cool, unique name for this skill. And I, I focused in specifically on the idea of the prefix try. Right? And I thought, well, the word trivia, that has the word try in it. That's kind of fun. But I can't call my skill trivia. There's lots and lots of trivia skills out there. I don't want to have to compete with all of them. Then I thought, well, maybe I could flip it around. Maybe I could call it like via try, right? That's kind of cool. And it, like, it has this meaning like by way of three. It's got three clues. It's all, this seems like this might be a really cool name. And I talked with some friends and I said, hey, I'm thinking about calling my skill via try. And they said, what? And I said, you know, like via, via, via try, by way of three. And like I felt myself having to explain the idea and I realized pretty quickly that I had missed the mark. I wasn't thinking about my customer. I wasn't thinking about what their experience was going to be like. I was trying to come up with something cool and unique just for myself. And so you may have already guessed what the name I came up with for the skill is, but I called it Three Clues. I've already said Three Clues to you 12 times just trying to explain what the skill does. So it was natural to try to come up with something that was that obvious, that was that easy. Uh, does anyone, by the way, has anyone solved my riddle that I presented to you? Anyone have an idea? You can just yell it out if you, have, if you know it. It was fruit, ears, socks. No one? They all have pears. That's the answer. Um, but let's, let's play the game really quick. Alexa, open three clues. Welcome to three clues. In this game, I will give you three clues, and you need to figure out what those clues have in common. Are you ready for your first three clues? Yes. 
The Beatles, Pete Rose, a mob assassin. Anyone? The Beatles, Pete Rose, a mob assassin. They all have hits. Correct. Mm. They all have hits. Are you ready for another three clues? No. Sorry to see you go. Catch you next time on Three Clues. Now, in addition to having a pretty basic name that is easy to remember, did you notice how many times the skill said Three Clues to the user? I say, are you ready for another Three Clues? Welcome to Three Clues. I'll see you next time on Three Clues. Like, I'm reinforcing that name over and over and over as we go through it. Um, I was supposed to show this as I did the demo, but we missed it. OK, let's move on to number three. In this case, this is a really, really important lesson to remember, and it's a hard one to learn. Focus on intents, not commands. Especially as the builder of the skill, it is very hard to remember that the user doesn't have access to all of the knowledge and information you have about whatever the domain happens to be. I built a skill called Voice Developer, and this skill specifically is designed to help Alexa skill developers be able to understand and learn a lot of the things that go on inside a skill. So you can say things like this. Ask voice developer about monetization, or tell me about persistence, or maybe something fun like ask voice developer to say bazinga. Right? There's a bunch of speech cons that we can use inside to, to have Alexa say things like that. These all seem very reasonable. As I was sitting down thinking about my voice design, this is like, obviously, this is the kind of thing users are going to say to my skill. The problem is, is that the user doesn't know they can ask about monetization. They don't know that they can ask about persistence. And they don't know the list of speech cons. So what they're more likely to say is something like these. Teach me something new. Play a speech con. What should I learn next? They're going to be more general, more generic than I anticipated. Now, I still want all of the things that I just showed you in the last slide to still work, because maybe they want to come back and learn more about monetization or remember what the thing said, or maybe they want to hear that speech con again because they're using it in a skill. So those things should still work. But as we think about shaping what our interaction model looks like and what the sample utterances represent, if we're not including things like this, we're missing an opportunity for our developers, because they don't know what to ask. They don't have a list in front of them. And so I'll give you a, a quick example of what this sounds like. Alexa, open voice developer. Hello, and welcome to Voice Developer. This skill can give you information and answers about Alexa skill development. Another thing I can do is play speech cons. Bazinga. Just ask me to say a speech con. What would you like to do next? Set emotion to normal. I've changed your emotion to normal. You can always change it again by saying, change the emotion to excited, disappointed, or normal. What can I help you do next? Give me a speech con. Rats. What would you like to try? Give me a speech con. Phew. What would you like to try? Give me a sound effect. Here's a random sound effect called monkey calls 3x1. <coughs> what should we do now? Alexa, stop. Toodaloo, caribou. OK. So there was a couple of things you can see there. The first one, I opened the skill, and wow, was she excited to talk to me. Right? I had changed the emotion earlier. I had forgotten that I changed that setting. And so we got this really excited Alexa voice to talk to us. Well, all of those things in this skill are changeable, so I was able to say, set the emotion to normal, and she stepped it back a notch, right? That wasn't as excited anymore. But then I was able to ask for speech cons, and she randomly went and got one for me. I was able to ask for a sound effect, and she gave me one. I didn't show it, because uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this. Uh, but you can also ask for things like, give me a laser sound effect. And she'll go into the library and find only sound effects that are laser sounds. So if you were looking for a beep, or a honk, or a a backing up sound, or a computer keyboard, or whatever it is. I think there's 3,000 different sound effects in our library. You can search for any of them that way. But you don't have to know what's there. It needs to be exploratory. We need to be able to dive in as a user and really take it apart and understand what's going on. OK, moving on to number four. 
we talked about sim like simplifying what goes on inside a skill and making sure that we're providing them with the opportunity to say what they want, not choose from a list of things we already know about. But another one is simplifying choices. There is a lot of times where we're in a conversation, and regardless of whether this is between two people or between us and one of these devices, eventually there's a question, right? As we talk about things, we say, hey, and tell me about this, right? As I was talking with a few of you before the session, there's always a question. Why, why did you come to this session? Or what are you working on with Alexa? And at that point, we have to think about what that answer might be. For a user, this often looks like an open-ended question, right? There's lots and lots of open-ended questions we can ask a user, and it's harder to catch those answers. But between slots and a bunch of other things that we can do, we can kind of narrow that down. Like open-ended questions like these, right? We have, is there something else I can help you with? Do you have another question? Would you like to know something else? Right? These are all things that we ask our users all the time, except that these aren't actually open-ended questions. These are all yes, no questions. Do you have something else? Do you want something else? Can I help you? Those are yes, no questions. And so if we pose questions like that to our user, people get really rigid when they're talking to a computer. They want to make sure that they're following the rules and staying on the rails. And so if you say, do you want to, they're going to say yes or no. If you say, can I help you, they're going to say yes or no. Yeah, I'd love some more help with that. Because you ask them a yes, no question, they're going, to, they're going to lock in much more than if we had those questions in a conversation. You and I all know that if I say, is there anything else I can help you with? What I want as an answer is the thing I can help you with. But when people talk to a computer, they don't respond that way. They respond with yes or no. And if the user says yes or no, now what do you do? Now you're going to ask the other question anyway, which is like, what else do you want to know? What can I help you with, right? And so as we think about these kinds of questions, we should start here. Unless we need a yes or no, we should always ask a question that results in the kind of answer that we want. And it's so easy to forget that because our conversational speech has some built-in understanding. When we talk to other humans, they know what we mean. But when humans talk to a computer, they're very focused on making sure they say the thing the computer asked for. We're going to have one moment of interactivity here in this session. All I'm going to ask anyone to do is raise your hand. It'll look like this. And what I'm going to do is pose to all of you a question. All you have to do is when you know the answer, all I want you to do is raise your hand. So this is a time. I just want to see how quickly all of the hands go up. You should be able to make a pretty quick decision. We have a pretty good processing system. I think everybody has enough RAM. And we should be good. So if you had to choose one of these things forever, this means you only get the one you choose, and you can never have anything else that's in this category. As soon as you know your answer, I just want you to raise your hand, OK? It's usually a pretty quick process, right? Most of the hands are already up. There's some people that just don't want to participate. Maybe there's some people that hate ice cream. It's fine. But we all knew our answer pretty quickly. And so you either chose vanilla or you were wrong, and that's fine. Um, but in either case, we were able to make our choice, right? We were able to say, oh, yeah, I, absolutely. Every time I go to a soft serve store, I'm getting a vanilla or a chocolate ice cream cone. OK, we're going to do the same thing, same exercise. We're going to do it again. As soon as you know your answer, Raise your hand. You only get one. This is a slower process, right? We have to stop. We have to evaluate, like, oh my god, those are a lot of choices. I'm not sure how I could just pick one from this entire list. Every time I go to like a fancy ice cream shop, I want to try something new. So how, how could I lock into any one of these forever? And if he's making me do this, ah, how do I decide? By the way, did any of you pick Swamp? Anyone? It's, it was on the board, I swear. Uh, it's actually, it looks pretty good. Um, malted milk balls, chocolate chips, M&Ms, caramel. I don't know if it would be my favorite, but it sounds pretty good. OK, the point in all of that was that when we're presented with a ton of choices, it becomes much, much harder to decide what we want to do for a number of reasons. One is, maybe I'm torn on which choice I want to make, but often it's because it's a huge mental load. 
I have to load all of those flavors into my head and then say, nope, that's my favorite. Right? If I don't read the whole board, I can't just commit to like the third choice and be like, yep, that's it, without knowing what else is there. So let's imagine for a second that we run a skill that sells fruit or a fruit store. We have lots and lots of offerings, right? And we might present this to our users like this. We have apples, bananas, oranges, lemons, grapes, kiwis, blackberries, strawberries, and mangoes. Which fruit do you want? Seems like a totally normal conversation to have. The problem with this, and if you've ever had that moment when you were in seventh grade history and you're not paying any attention and your teacher's talking and talking and talking and then they say, Jeff, what do you think about that? And you're like, I, I have no idea what the question is. I don't know what you were talking about. We need to start over. The same thing happens here. First, we just started talking to our user, and we said, we have apples, bananas, oranges, and we gave them a long, long list of things without telling them that, by the way, you're going to need to pick one of these. We didn't warn them. We just started talking. And so it wasn't until about halfway through that they're like, should I be paying attention to this list? Is this going to be important later? Is this going to be on the test? And then later, we asked them, what fruit do you want? Well, we asked the question, late. We asked the question at the end. If we flip this around and we ask the question first, hey, we have a bunch of fruits, which one would you like? We offer strawberries, bananas, mangoes, whatever. Now they know that they're supposed to be paying attention and that they should pick from the list of items you're gonna give them. We can scale this back and make it easier, right? We could also do something like this. Which fruit do you want? We have apples, bananas, oranges, or lots of others, right? And we could let the user just say, I want mangoes. And if our store offers mangoes, then we can say, cool, I heard you say mangoes. How many would you like? But we might also not offer mangoes, or maybe they're not in season. And so we could say, hey, I heard you say mangoes. We're currently out of mangoes right now. But we could also offer you something like guava or cantaloupe or some other fruit that may be similar. In all of these cases, though, we need to make sure we're thinking about what the user knows and what's happening inside their head. If we ask them the question first, they know they need to come up with an answer. And if we give them a longer list, they better be prepared for that list. It's a challenging problem, but it's really quite simple if you just think about asking the question first, which is different than we would normally do in speech. All right, let's move on to number five. <coughs> Excuse me. This is one that I really enjoy, and it's so easy to do, and some of you will hold your breath even as I'm doing this, but I call it the one breath test. And the point of this idea is to make sure that as you're having a device speak to a user, that it's not speaking longer than you could say in one breath. I like to have illustrations, photos of this, right? You can imagine this guy taking a big, deep breath and holding it. How long could I talk on one breath? It's not very long. It's a couple of sentences, maybe. Another more hardcore illustration of this, a diver with no tank. You get one breath. That's it. If you decide to go longer than one breath, that, that could be the end. Um, but you think about how long you can really hold your breath without any significant training, right? I mean, I'm sure these divers can hold their breath for six, seven minutes. But uh, I know my breath, if I can hold it a minute, that's pretty good. So I have an example of this. Um, I have a skill called the Unofficial Star Wars Data Bank. Uh, it's meant to give you information about every planet and vehicle and weapon and species in the Star Wars universe. Uh, and I'm going to give you some contrasting examples of too much and too little. Alexa, open the Unofficial Star Wars Data Bank. OK, here's Unofficial Star Wars Facts. Oh, unofficial oh, Star oh, Wars no. Facts contains mature content that Alexa, may not be suitable. stop. Alexa, open unofficial Star Wars data bank, please. Welcome. I can answer your questions about people and places in the Star Wars universe, and even vehicles, weapons, or droids. What would you like to know about? Tell me about Luke Skywalker. We warned you. Always let the Wookiee win. Is there something else you would like to know? Tell me about Luke Skywalker. You asked me about Luke Skywalker. 
Luke Skywalker was a Tatooine farm boy who rose from humble beginnings to become one of the greatest Jedi the galaxy has ever known. Alarmed with his friends Princess Leia and Han Solo, Luke battled the evil Empire, discovered the truth of his parentage, and ended the tyranny of the Sith. A generation later, the location of the famed Jedi Master was one of the galaxy's greatest mysteries. What else can I provide information about? Tell me about Darth Vader. You asked me about Darth Vader. Darth Vader is a bad, bad, bad man. Also, spoiler alert. He is Luke Skywalker's father. What else can I provide information about? Stop. Goodbye. Okay, so you can see that as I'm explaining who Luke Skywalker is, especially in what is supposed to be a concise format, that was a pretty long explanation. I was talking about Han and Chewie and Leia and all sorts of other stuff. I could have kept it simple. I could give the user an option, right? Say, hey, do you want to hear the longer history? Yes, I do, and then I've signed up for it. But in general, I probably just wanted the short, concise example. The Darth Vader example I gave was probably a little too short. It didn't really give me anything, just that he's a bad, bad, bad man. But it's, a, it's an important thing to think about is how much can we really say in one breath? And if we write our content that way, as, as our designers are sitting thinking about what we're gonna say in these situations, if you can keep it under one breath, I think that you're gonna find it's much more engaging for your users. Because as you saw I was doing on stage, I'm like, come on, come on, I, I wanna get to the point where I talk. I'm done with hearing all of this. We don't want that experience for our users. We wanna make sure that they feel like they can talk anytime they want. And they can, of course, they can always interrupt. But it doesn't feel like they're doing the right thing if they're interrupting your skill. Okay, number six. Including a variety of responses. This is something that becomes increasingly important as our skills get more and more complex. We talk about things like conversations. And if you think about sitting down to play a game of chess with someone you've never met before, you wouldn't expect that they were gonna make the same moves that you see every other user make. It's gonna be different, there's gonna be variety. It would be incredibly boring to play a game of chess where every time we played, the opponent always made the same moves. We would beat them, we would defeat them quickly, we would understand and be able to optimize around that. But as we think about building applications today, things like this or this are presented to us all the time. These are guidelines for how we build visual interfaces for humans. We use words like predictable and consistent. And I'm here to tell you that without a doubt, we don't want to do this with voice. We don't want to be predictable or consistent. There are a lot of things that we want to do in a way that a user can expect. But we want to do almost everything we know about building applications traditionally, we want to flip those upside down. The first way that I like to think about doing this is by keeping it fresh and random. I have a database that I use for every single application that I build. And I have a, a table in that database called speech. And every type of speech that might happen inside my application, I put them there. I have a speech type. It might be welcome. It might be goodbye. There's all sorts of different speech types in there. But in that database, I don't have one welcome and one goodbye. I have 15. For every single thing that I can say to the user, there is not a single line of speech in any of my code. All of it lives in a database. And I have five, seven, 10 versions of everything that I want to say. And it might be welcome to the skill or welcome to our skill. This is something you can do, right? They're all slight modern variations on the exact same concept. But what you find is that it becomes a little more unpredictable for your user. They're not hearing the same words that they heard every single time that they've used your skill. Because if you've done beta testing with users, and you do do this, where you have the same static content all the time, users feel like they did when we were talking about the one breath test. OK, OK, cool, cool. I just want to get to the, I know where I want to go. Just let me get there, right? And in a mobile app, they can kind of click and move faster than, than they want to, that they want to. But with voice, they have to mostly wait until you're done talking. And so if you keep it unpredictable, it forces them to listen. It forces them to think about, like, what are they asking me? And this sounds different than I was remembering. And they don't get into that habit of, yeah, yeah, computer, I just want to get to the thing I want. 
Um, you, uh, I have another game called TKO Trivia, um, and I'm, I'm not gonna, I, I could open this, but I wanna make sure I'm conscious of time here. Um, but the idea behind this game is that there's hundreds and hundreds of trivia questions inside of it, uh, but when you open the skill, when you leave the skill, any of the interactions you have during the time that you're in the skill, all of those things are randomized so that you have a long, long variance in how you're gonna expect to talk to this device. This is what it looks like for me. These are uh, a list of my goodbyes. So you can see that I have peace out and gotta go buffalo. By the way, did you guys know you've got like see you later, croc see you later alligator after a while crocodile? Did you know there's dozens of others? I'm, I'm a parent of an 18 year old and a 14 year old and I only learned this like a year ago. Bye bye butterfly, out the door dinosaur, there's all sorts of those fun little rhymes. I had no idea. So you guys learned something new today, maybe. But what I do is I, when someone leaves my skill, I randomly grab one of these. Every single time, it's going to feel different. In addition to that, we can also keep it fresh. Again, randomization is an important part of all of this. Varying the orders that you present your statements. Think about being a travel agent for a minute. You have a skill and you have five values that you really need before anyone can do anything with your skill, right? I need to know where you're flying from, where you're flying to, what your, uh, what your airline might be, and of course the dates that you're going to leave and, and return. So I need all five of those, but is there a set of rules that define in what order I need to collect that information? Because if I am building a skill and I present it in the same order every single time, People stop listening. They tune out. In fact, I'll, I'll give you a great example of this that we've all experienced in our lives. Uh, if you've ever called any kind of like bank or insurance company or anybody that's gonna put you on the phone on hold and it's like press one to do this, press two, right? As we think about that kind of experience, how many times have you gotten to the last choice and forgotten what the choice you should make is? Right, you're like, was it four? I can't, I don't remember. And if you guys don't know, there's actually, IVRs have had a, a, a shortcut built into them for a long time. It's not well publicized. But if you ever want to get back to the beginning, to take a step back in an IVR, all you have to do, hang up, call back, and you're right back in where you want to be, right? That's supposed to be funny. No one's laughing. That's all right. So uh, as we think about this kind of experience, we don't want people to tune out. We don't want them to have that phone system experience where it's like, well, what did it ask me? I don't even remember anymore. So by mixing it up, origin, destination, airline, departure date, return date, why couldn't I next time make it departure date, return date, origin, destination, airline? That's the order I'm gonna ask the questions next time. And then the next time I'm gonna mix it up again. It turns out there's 25 different varieties of ways I can do that. As we think about all of the permutations and all the ways that we can do this, what we're trying to do with these actions is capture our users' attention. We wanna make sure that they're paying attention to what we're saying so that they can give the appropriate answer for the question that was asked. What ends up happening when things are predictable and boring and users turn, tune out is that they blame the software. This is dumb, it doesn't even know what I'm trying to do. Well, no, I asked you what airline you want and you said December. Like that's, that's really the problem is you didn't pay attention. And so everything that we can do as developers to hold on to their attention and make sure that they are paying attention to the things that need to happen goes a long way in them having a great experience with your, voice, with your voice app. All right, moving on to number seven, handling the unexpected gracefully. This happens all the time. Many of you, if you've built a skill before, you've heard something like, um, the skill has run into an unexpected response, right? Or something like that, I can't remember the exact phrase. Uh, I, actually, I wrote it down for myself. There was a problem with the requested skills response. Right? We've probably heard this before. This is a very common error message that Alexa uses when something goes wrong in your code. First of all, I mean, if, if we're really doing it, we should make sure that those kinds of errors aren't happening. But when we're talking to APIs or synchronous calls or whatever it might be, there's times where we're going to have errors. Maybe an API crashed or a database is missing or whatever. But we don't have to present it in a way that is confusing to a user. We can have some fun with it. We can redirect them to the things that we are confident will work. Instead of a basic error message like this, we could change it. It seems our trivia questions are better than our software developers. <coughs> Something is broken, we've alerted our team to the problem. Can I give you a random trivia question instead? Right, I've redirected them to something that I'm confident will work every time. 
And we've kind of just blown off the error, like, oh, yeah, something went wrong. Sorry, I couldn't do that right now. And so we see that with um, <coughs> my, my baseball skill. If we think about that baseball skill that I asked before, it makes a lot of sense if I'm asking about the Cleveland Guardians or the Washington Nationals that we're going to get the kinds of responses that we want. But what if somebody says something like Las Vegas Raiders? What is the skill expected to do in that case? Is it supposed to say, I don't know what that is? Maybe. Maybe they said the New York Jets, right? That's the example I have here on the screen. I'm sorry, the New York Jets aren't a baseball team. Is there a different team I can tell you about? <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what's nice about this is that it doesn't matter that it's the New York Jets. I haven't actually identified or understood what they said at all. What I've done instead is just parroted back what they said to me and said, hey, that's not a baseball team. I don't have to do any extra work. I don't have to have a catalog of every possible team or anything crazy like that. I can just say, hey, you said this thing. That's not a baseball team, but let's think about teams that are in the major leagues. Let's talk about those. Those are the ones that I'm really good at knowing things about. These kinds of error messages go such a long way in making your users feel confident. When we have a voice experience, and for better or for worse, there's a wide variety of voice experiences out there, right? There are some that were built by a simple hobbyist. He wanted to build a cool experience just for himself, published it to the store, and it's got tons of errors and issues. And someone stumbles onto that, and they realize that this is, a, this is an awful experience. There's so many errors, and everything's going wrong. So what we don't want them to feel like is that our skill isn't good. We don't want them to feel like, oh, this is unpredictable or unreliable. I'm never using this again. Errors are going to happen. They happen in all software. But we want to make sure that we're giving them the confidence that like, we've got it, we've handled it. Here's some things you can still do as a part of whatever our experience happens to be. And we've alerted our team that, hey, there's, there's an issue here. Really, really important stuff. OK, number eight. This is going to sound silly to some of you, but I want you to make enhancements based on data. Now, there's an assumption here that you're going to make enhancements. I think a lot of people think about building software, whether that's an app or a website or a skill or whatever it is. You build it. You spend all this time putting content into it. You launch it to the world. You tweet about it, and you're done. Whew. Thank goodness. But that's not really how software works. Right? The day we launch something is really the first day. And now we need to refine and revise and update and edit all of the things that our users are interacting with. We want to make sure that we have understanding of what works and what doesn't work and what are users asking for. <coughs> I'm have to drink some water. And we want to make sure that we're using the data that we can collect in a way that makes our skill better for our users in the future. I have an example of that here on the next screen. This is some data that I collected from an early version of that voice developer skill that I showed you. And one of the things that it also does is it answers questions. It can tell you about persistence or monetization in the examples I showed you. But you can see here that people were asking about persistence. They were asking about spoken languages. They wanted to know about events that were coming up. They wanted to know about dialogue management and dev tips. And they even wanted to know what it knew about them. That was one of the things they asked, was like, tell me about myself. They were hoping that maybe there was some kind of secret that would let them know like, what the skill knows about them. These kinds of things give us insights into the things that users really want. And what we found is that we already had answers for persistence in spoken languages, but we didn't have anything for events. Our users let us know that that was something that they expected this skill to deliver to them. So we sat down, and we engineered a little bit, and we figured out exactly what we wanted the skill to do to be able to tell them about events. <clears throat> added some data, added some utterances, added some intents. And before we knew it, now they could ask about upcoming events like reInvent, and when, what's going on, and who's going to be there, and what sessions you can see. This helps us drive our application to be better. We also looked at the analytics of our different intents. You can see here that I have get news. This was like, hey, what's the latest with Alexa? Tell me what's, what are things that I need to know as a developer today? The answer in 10 is the one I was just telling you about. And then we have stop and launch, some basic things. Uh, and then way down here, I had this display template intent. Now, this is a little bit older. Display templates uh, aren't used as commonly anymore now that we have Alexa presentation language, which allows you to do a lot of cool things with screens. But when we had display templates, they were all these basic layouts for how you might want to present something on a screen. And there were about 16 different ones. And I wanted to let the user see each of them. 
But initially, I had only built the basic seven. And then there were nine others that were kind of unique or customized in some way. So I, in my mind, I was like, we need to get the rest of those display templates in there. That's what developers are going to want. They're going to want to see all of this stuff. And what the data showed me is, in fact, compared to the rest of this stuff, nobody really cared about the display template functionality at all. And there's no reason for me to invest any more time building on that right now when I have so many more answers, so much other news or interactive data that I could give them. And so that's where we spend our time. All right, moving on to number nine. Provide contextual help. This is another thing that I see across the board in most of the voice applications that I've used. Uh, on Alexa, you have to provide the Amazon.help intent. This is the thing that allows a user to indicate that they need help or they don't understand something or they need some assistance in some way inside your skill. What happens most of the time is that this is a, a phoned in extra. Like, we have to do this, but we'll just do the minimum, right? Let's imagine we run a pizza shop. It ends up looking a lot more like an about page on a website than it does help. Someone says help to your skill. They may be in the middle of anything. They're like, help, or I, I, I need assistance, or I don't know what to do. And they get this. Well, our skill lets you order from our big menu of pizza, breadsticks, pasta, sandwiches, wings, and desserts. What would you like to do? Well, I needed help with the thing I was doing, but it's good to know you guys sell sandwiches. Right? Like, this is not help. As much as we possibly can, what we want to do is understand what was the user doing, how were they doing it, how can we provide them the best possible experience when they don't know how to do something. And so that same pizza shop could do something like this instead. It looks like you're trying to order a pizza. You can add or remove toppings by saying add pepperoni or remove anchovies. You can also add extras like sauces, extra cheese, or a different crust, just ask. Did you want to go back to your pizza or did you need help with something else? And at that point, they could say, oh, you know what, I just wanted to call the store. Or what's the address? Or what's the delivery time going to be? Or any of the other things that you might want to ask a pizza skill. But they might have also just not been able to figure out how to add pineapple to their pizza. And so they were just trying to ask for help to figure out how to do that. Allowing them to go right back to the experience they were in, doing the things that they were doing, requires some engineering, right? We have to write some code. We have to persist a bunch of data and state. But at the end of the day, we're getting the user exactly what they want the way that they want it. What we're trying to do is create a situation in which the user, this is one of the cheesiest photos I've ever used, but it's where the user can say, I can, right? I can do this on my own. I don't need help. I don't need to pick up a phone. I don't need to use another app. This voice experience works exactly the way that I expect it to. And it solves the problem for me and gives me the utility that I was looking for. OK, number 10. Beta, beta test with real users. I don't know if it's hubris or arrogance, but as developers, we have it in our heads that we know how users are going to talk, how they're going to speak to our skill, the things that they're going to say. I built my, my user interface. It's good. You're wrong. All of you are wrong. Uh, and the reason for that is because so many people say the same things so many different ways. There's so many ways to just ask someone what the weather is like outside. Is it going to rain? Do I need an umbrella? What's the, you know, is, what's the weather like later? All of those really mean the same thing. But there's no, we, no way we, as a small team, two or three people, can possibly predict all of those things. So one of the things I always recommend if you're not using this tool is that we offer a beta testing tool right in the developer console. You can push your skill out to up to 5,000 users. It can last up to 90 days. If you're not using this, I can't recommend it enough. Start with your friends and family. Say, hey, I built this cool thing. I'd love for you guys to just try it. Uh, if it's something for your business, roll it out to a small set of customers. We also offer A, B testing, so you could push it out and try A for some and B for others to see what works better. But ultimately, you want to get people using this thing. You want utterances to come in. You want to see what the errors you're getting are, what the slot fills are that you weren't anticipating. Start with your stock photo family if you have to, but somehow you need to get real people that aren't you, that aren't, aren't using your brain to do this. One of the fondest times I can remember from working on this team, and I've been on the Alexa team about six and a half years, was sitting around with a bunch of my colleagues, trying each other's skills. 
And of course, we were trying to break each other's skills, right? What can I say that would make this fail? And not just like, hey, I don't know what to do, but like really throw them some, some kind of curveball. But we sat in this room and we would talk to skills and we would share ideas and it was absolutely awesome. It was so much fun to just try to break everybody's software. But at the end of the day, <clears throat> you don't need beta testing. You don't even need to write a line of code. If you want to know how your skill is going to work, I want you to think what it would be like to stand behind a curtain and just talk to someone. I want you to imagine for a minute you've not written a line of code, you have an idea for a skill, and you just want to do that thing. Go stand behind a curtain, get in a giant refrigerator box, I don't care how you handle it, but have some of your customers, or even just some of your colleagues, come up, having understood the scope of what your skill is supposed to do, and talk to you. And have someone there writing everything down, or record it. But you'll respond out of the box, you can't see body language, you can't see facial expressions, all you get is the words that the user said. And then you have to respond in a way that your APIs can actually handle, right? Like if someone were to ask any banking app on Earth, what is the average balance of my seven accounts? No banking app can do that, right? So if someone comes up and asks that question for some legitimate reason, maybe we should think about providing that. I hadn't considered averaging their bank accounts. Maybe that's something that's useful. But standing behind that curtain will give you instant visibility into what the scope of your skill is and isn't, what people expect it to do, what they don't expect it to do, uh, and give you a really good foundation for what your interaction, what your interaction model should look like. <coughs> I mentioned earlier thinking about what kind of capabilities your skills should have, and that you don't want to use the things that are on the front page of your mobile app if you have one at all. I'm assuming everyone knows what I'm referencing with these shoes, but if you think about when she was wearing them, and what she did to get home, she tapped her feet together three times. And that was the thing that got her home. And I like to use this reference specifically because these are the things that you're gonna to wanna to identify in your software. What are the most important things that your users do in your software today that require at least three clicks? Because if they have to pull out your app, and they maybe have to log in, but then they have to click two or three more times to get to the data they want, those are the most valuable candidates for something with voice. Because now they can just like talk in their kitchen and get exactly that same information. Or while they're sitting at a boardroom table, they can find out how many widgets we sold yesterday. These kinds of things, that, that three clicks experience, are the things that you will find your users want the most. No one's asking for their bank balance alone because they, it's so easy to get, right? I pull out my phone, I open my banking app, and boom, I've, I know exactly how much money I, I don't have. Uh, but these are important lessons to learn because what we try to do is get the thing that's the most obvious, but we already solved that problem. We already have a website or a mobile app or whatever, and if you wanna provide that information too, that's fine, but I don't think that's where your users are gonna find the use, most utility. Okay, we've talked about a ton of things here, lots of numbers, lots of, Interesting stuff to get into. Does anyone want a bonus 11th tip? Okay, I'm gonna do it anyway, because it's in the slide deck. Uh, the 11th tip, monetize your stuff. This isn't just about like, hey, make some money for your company, or find a way to rake money out of your customers. This is about making sure that you understand the value that you're providing to them. And I just wanna make sure that everybody's familiar with all of the mechanisms that are available to do this today. One, we have something we call ISPs, in-skill purchasing. You can offer subscriptions. You can offer one-time purchases. Uh, I like to define that, like imagine that adventure game we were playing earlier. You encounter a, a giant ogre, and the only way to defeat him is with this huge ax. Well, just before you encounter the ogre, you happen to run into a traveling salesman, and he happens to sell an ax that can defeat that ogre. And you can buy it for $1.99, or you can keep grinding our game for another six hours, and ultimately get enough in-game money to buy it yourself. Those one-time purchases, once you have that act, you have it for the rest of the game. It never expires, it never just gets destroyed, anything like that. And then we also have consumables. Consumables allow you to do things like hints or coins or something like that, where people buy 100 coins, and then when they use them up, they can buy 100 more. These things apply to lots and lots of scenarios that aren't just games. There's lots of ways that you can use these kinds of in-skill purchases um, all three of those categories are easily implemented, 
Um, and as I said, like maybe you have an ogre with an ax that you want to take on. We also offer paid skills. Maybe you want your skill to only be used by paying customers. You could do that too. We offer one-time purchases. They pay once and they get access to your skill, but they can also do it with a subscription where they pay $4.99 a month to continue to have access to whatever your software is. But beyond that, we also have the ability to do a wide range of shopping. You can sell your own products. We offer a service called Amazon Pay, which you may have heard of. Uh, Amazon Pay, you can sell any physical goods and services that you'd like. If you're a, a flower shop or a donut shop and you want people to be able to order donuts from your store and have them delivered, you can do that. They can order completely with their voice. And they, the Amazon Pay connection will allow them to use the default credit card on their Amazon account to pay you, and the entire transaction is handled behind the scenes. They can order it just with their voice. But let's go beyond that. Let's say that we have a skill that doesn't inherently sell products. We have a, a, re, a relaxation, a yoga skill, right? Where we're gonna work through yoga exercises and I have a coach that's gonna walk me through all of those things. But as someone that's well-versed and knowledgeable about yoga, I probably also have specific ideas about the kinds of yoga mats someone might use, right? And if I have an idea about a yoga mat that I think I really love, maybe I want my customers to buy that yoga mat also. So we recently introduced something called Alexa Shopping Actions, which allows you to offer products on Amazon. I'm not sure about that. I know. Offer products on Amazon.com that they can buy through your skill. Now, maybe this makes sense because you sell these yoga mats yourself, and you sell them on Amazon.com, so it's super easy. You just implement it, boom, set it up, and now you're selling your products on Amazon, and you're ready to go. But I don't think all of us have products that we're selling directly on Amazon, although maybe some of you are. But instead, you have a, a skill that reviews board games. You're a passionate board game player. You have lots of opinions on new board games. You're constantly buying new ones. And so you do reviews. You buy games, and you create video reviews, and you have all sorts of information about what kind of game people might like or don't like. And so as they tune into your skill to ask about a review on a specific game, you might say, do you want to buy this game? And they can buy that product from Amazon through your skill. Now, at first, that sounds like, well, that's great. I'm just selling stuff for Amazon. But we also offer, if you guys are familiar with Amazon Associates, it's the ability to earn a commission on all of the products that you sell. So even though you don't sell any products, you could sell yoga mats or board games or books or anything else you can imagine on Amazon directly through your software as well. And so if you're in the healthcare space, you could sell thermometers. Uh, or heart rate monitors or any of the other things that might make sense for your customers, it's an easy way to recommend the kinds of products and services that probably best integrate in your customers' lives based on the thing that they're doing with your skill. Okay, so we've talked about a ton of different things. These are the 10. I saw some people taking pictures, but this is the one you probably want to take a picture of. I'll add number 11 to the bottom for you. 11 things every voice app should do. This is a lot to think about. Obviously, there's many, many things that go into building a great voice experience and making sure that people know exactly what it is they need to do and how they want to do it in a comfortable, familiar way that isn't frustrating. But I think these tips, thinking about this stuff and trying to implement this in the software that you're building, will give you a huge head start in everything that you're trying to accomplish. So with that, I will say thank you so much for being here. We have a few minutes, so if there are any questions, I'm happy to take them, uh, either here or off the stage. But uh, honestly, this was my pleasure. Thank you.